Welcome to Medicare Connect Radio, sponsored by Millennium Physician Group. I'm Michelle McCormick. Every week, we talk about the healthcare issues that are important to you, whether you're 65 or older, maybe approaching 65, or you're making healthcare decisions for a loved one who's in their golden years. We're inviting providers and experts to share insights to help you take control of your healthcare decisions. Is that headache you have, allergies, stress, maybe it's due to COVID or other illness, or maybe it's even a migraine. June is National Migraine and Headache Awareness Month, and in this episode, we're going to talk with a neurologist about the different types of headaches we get, can we prevent them, and how do we treat the pain in our brain. But first, Millennium Physician Group has quickly become the leading independent physician group with more than 800 healthcare providers across Florida and growing. Services center on primary care and are complemented by specialty care, walk-in centers, radiology, and lab services, telehealth, wellness programs, home health, hospital care, and so much more. Nationally recognized as a consistently top-rated accountable care organization with consistently high levels of physician engagement, Millennium aims to create a genuinely connected healthcare experience for patients. And we want to be your connection to a healthier life. Learn more at at millenniumphysician.com. Well, migraine is a common problem. Approximately 20% of women and about hmm, 6.5% men of, of men in the U.S. suffer from migraine headaches with or without an aura. And we're going to talk about auras because i got a good story for you, doctor. Okay. Attack rates are one or more per month in most people, and most experience interference with activities of daily living in 50% or more of their attacks. So really an important problem as well as a common one. Joining us today is Dr. Saeed Assad, a neurologist and board-certified traumatic brain injury physician. He's also the founder of Universal Neurological Neurological Care in Jacksonville, Florida. So, Dr. Assad, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, That was a mouthful, and uh, I uh, just really am happy you're here with me today. This is a really important topic. Give us a little bit of background about you and and your, your office. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, I am very passionate about talking about conditions of the brain, um, so I, I appreciate this opportunity um, to um, to share some information about this very important topic. Um, as far as um, my background, so um, I am trained and board certified in nuclear medicine and neurology, and uh, so I do a little bit of nuclear medicine work. That is basically imaging, PET scans, things like that, but most of my focus is neurology. Um, I, uh, as you mentioned, universal neurological care is my practice. Uh, We, again, focus on traumatic brain injuries, but a lot of people with brain injury have headache syndromes, uh, migraines, as well as other types of headache syndromes. Um, And and so that becomes a very important part of what we do. Um, I also um, am the medical director for the Eisenhower Center uh, Brain Injury Rehab Center here in town. It's a small center. We mainly take care of military vets who've had brain injuries but are also suffering from headaches amongst other other issues. and so that uh, is is my my interest in in this particular topic. Yeah, what led you down the the path of the brain? Um, so it's interesting. Um, when I was um, in medical school, uh, I thought neurology was very fascinating, but I also thought it was very depressing because we had conditions that we couldn't really do a whole lot for, like Lou Gehrig's disease. Mm-hmm. Um, as time has gone on, we have discovered more and more treatments, and I tried a couple other things and then came back to neurology, and I'm really fascinated. I mean, the brain is the ultimate computer uh, that that we know of. It's what gives us, you know, uh, our appreciation of the world, and it's just fascinating. Yeah, and, and still being discovered. So, well, let's let you know. You touched on something. Let's give a little bit of anatomy of mm-hmm. a brain. Sure. So, you know, some people are like, "Oh, I, I have more of a A brain or a B brain." You know, mm-hmm. let's well, let's talk about the anatomy of a brain and and what's going on up here. Oh, sure. Yeah. Now, that's that's a very interesting and huge topic. Uh, but so, um, you know, I think probably around the mid 1800s is when researchers, scientists, doctors started discovering that different parts of the brain control different things. So our executive tasks, our organizational skills, those kinds of things live in the front part of our brain, our memory, um, at least the creation of memory happens in the temporal lobes, as does uh, hearing, you know, our vision uh, stimulus goes into the occipital cortex, which is in the back of the brain. So different parts of the brain. And then the brainstem is very important. That's like the motherboard. It's the computer that integrates all of our senses. Um, and then the emotional part of the brain is the limbic system. That's also involved in a, a lot of important uh, uh, functions. Um, 
did you want me to? Hey, you can keep going. You can I... keep going. But, you know, as, as far as what we're talking about today, you know, sure. it's like, how does our brain, you know, we feel pain all over our body, but sure. we feel it from the brain. Sure. Right. So what happens when the brain hurts? Sure. So it's <laughs> a very good question. So interestingly, the brain senses pain from the whole body. But if you had a awake person and you were cutting into their brain, they would not feel it. Um, so that's, that's a little bit unusual. Hmm. Um, and pain is important because from a survival perspective, uh, pain is what helps us stay away from stimuli that are harmful to us. Um, and, and sometimes it doesn't even reach the brain. So for example, if I, if I put my hand on a hot stove, mm -hmm. I'm going to pull it away even before the impulse gets to my brain because my spinal cord will pull it away before I damage tissue. Uh, so some of the mechanisms are reflexively built in, uh, but certainly that information eventually gets to the thalamus, which is the relay station in the brain, and then goes to the sensory cortex, which analyzes the pain and makes sense of the pain in, in, you know, in terms of, uh, how we view the world. Yeah, it, it's very fascinating. Yeah, I can sure. see why you would want to dive into that a little bit too. Right. All right, so it is National Headache, National Migraine and Headache Awareness Month, which, you know, it seems like there's a month for everything, right? <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> so why do you think there's a month focused just on on this topic? I'm actually glad that there is a month focused on this topic because like you mentioned the statistics in the beginning, um, here's something interesting. 97% of the population experiences tension headaches. I'm mm -hmm. actually surprised 3% of people don't. Right. Like, I agree. I would have thought everybody experiences. Yeah. Tension I would feel like I wake up every day with a headache. Right. And, and I don't know if it's from the air conditioning blowing on or the, you know, the fan or tension. Sure. Sure. Um, but even, even, um, fairly debilitating headaches like migraine headaches are fairly common. If 20% of uh, women and 6.5% of men have, have this condition, this can be a disabling condition. And in this day and age, it's, it's very, very manageable. And so it's, it's, really, it's a really important topic. It's funny, mm -hmm. I have medical students who rotate with me and <clears throat> I find that in our medical school educations, we don't devote enough time to talking about or teaching about headaches. And even if I have students who are planning to go into family practice or internal medicine or any other field of, of medicine, I always tell them, listen, if, if you take one thing away from this rotation, I really want you to get headaches down because that is such an important topic. And I feel that um, a lot of times it's not managed the way it can be. Um, so, yeah. So then what is a headache? Like, is, what is the clinical definition of a headache? Sure. A headache is basically pain um, in the region of the head. Um, and it, um, you know, there's an entire classification system, but the two most important, um, components are primary headaches and secondary headaches. Um, that's important because secondary headaches are caused from things like cerebral aneurysms and tumors and abscesses and, uh, things that can kill us, things that can harm us. And we want to be aware of the red flags that are raised by someone who's experiencing an aneurysm rupture. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to tell them, oh, you know, it's just a headache and yeah. And, and right. then, you know, something terrible happens. Um, so that's, that's the first thing we're trained to identify is, is pick up those red flags for secondary headaches. And then the vast majority of headaches are primary headaches. So we talked about tension headaches and, and migraine headaches, but there's also cluster headaches. There's also hemicrania. Um, so there's, there's what we call endomethacin responsive headaches. And then there's some rare ones um, as well. Um, and so um, those are generally, there, there's a genetic predisposition to them. So for example, um, migraine headaches, there's 38 different genes that, mm. that code for migraine headaches. And in the vast majority of cases, these are autosomal dominant, which means that if one of my parents has a migraine, um, I have a 50% chance of inheriting the genetic uh, predisposition. If both parents have it, I will inherit it. Um, but, but just because you inherit the genes doesn't mean you will have migraines. The genetics loads the gun, something else has to pull the trigger. And so then, you know, so a lot of people have the genetic predisposition. Um, let's say it's a 13 year old girl. She's never had, you know, uh, mm -hmm. migraines before she starts having her cycles. Right. And then in the perimenstrual period is the, the drop in estrogen progesterone right before the, the menstrual bleed will trigger, you know, their first migraine. And then as they get older, maybe with school, with stress, with life, with kids, those are all triggers, you know, that will uh, maybe increase their migraine frequency. And uh, that's why part of 
part of it is just identifying what the triggers are, and then the rest is is managing um, the thresholds so you don't break break into one. And when when you do, you have something that knocks it out. Yeah, we're going to continue that conversation. I I really want to dive into that a little bit more, um, especially when with it starting so young and then going through all the the 20s and stuff, because there's a history there. So stick around. Dr. Saeed Asad, a neurologist and board certified traumatic brain injury physician from Universal Neurological Care in Jacksonville, will return with us in just a minute. You're listening to Medicare Connect Radio, sponsored by Millennium Physician Group. Welcome to Medicare Connect Radio, sponsored by Millennium Physician Group. I'm Michelle McCormick. Every week, we're talking about the healthcare issues that are important to you, whether you're 65 or older, maybe approaching 65, and maybe you're the one making decisions for a loved one. We invite providers and experts to share insights into helping you take control of your healthcare decisions. Well, is that headache you have? Is it allergies, stress? Maybe it's due to COVID or another illness, or perhaps it's a migraine. June is National Migraine and Headache Awareness Month. And in this episode, we're talking with Dr. Saeed Assad, a neurologist, about the different types of headaches we get, how we can prevent them, maybe, and how we can treat our pain in the brain. So, Dr. Assad, thank you. In the first segment, we talked about kind of the anatomy of a brain. We were really kind of diving into what is a headache sure. and basic pain. You touched on something um, about the, I think it was the secondary headache, sure. um, the aneurysm. Sure. You know, how do we... S- not freak out when we have like a really painful headache and go immediately to, I have an aneurysm. Sure. Um, so if someone has a history of migraines and they experience a headache, which is different from their usual migraines, or if it's the worst headache of their life, or if they have other symptoms. So we use a word in neurology, focal deficits or lateralized deficits. So for example, if half your body is numb or half your body is weak or half your vision is gone or um, you're confused and disoriented, um, if you have fevers and chills, Mm -hmm. those are all red flags. Now, the complex part of all this is you can actually have migraines with sensory loss in half your body. You can actually have migraines where half your body gets weak. We call that a hemiplegic migraine. And for all practical purposes, it looks just like a stroke mm-hmm. until you rule out a stroke with the workup. So so it's not that straightforward. You can have a migraine with focal deficits too. However, if you do have focal deficits, please go to the emergency room and get evaluated because you don't want to miss uh, an aneurysm or a stroke or something and uh, end up not getting treatment quickly. Yeah, that that that's very good information to know. So we were also discussing um, migraines uh, being somewhat genetic. Um, and I remember when I was in college, I was driving down the road and I was, you know, I, I was taking birth control pills at the time I was in college and, um, my lips went numb, mm-hmm. like super numb. And then I had this incredibly painful headache and I was driving down the road. And I was like, what is that? That's the most weird, weird feeling I've ever had. Well, fast forward, I finally went to a doctor and they're like, oh, that, that's totally a migraine. Let's make, let's make sure you get on a low estrogen pill, blah, blah. And they did all that. But then what happened after that was I started seeing these little starbursts. So like it would start really tiny and then we'd get really, really big. And it was like, it looked like a starburst that you would see. It was very colorful and and did all these weird lights things. And then all of a sudden my peripheral vision was just like gone. And I was like, that's odd. Ocular migraine is what I was finally diagnosed with having. So, um, and, and fast forward, I'm not going to say how many years later from college, but, you know, fast forward 30 years later and I still get them, but not as often, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm now in, in menopause Mm -hmm. and it's like, it's got to have to do with some kind of estrogen thing from beginning to now. Sure. Sure. No, you're, you're absolutely correct. And I loved your description of the, uh, the, uh, visual auras. Um, so it's interesting back in the, again, mid 1800s, um, there were some French artists who would get migraines with auras and they drew these paintings of what they would see because for the rest of us who don't get migraines, um, we had no idea what white migraineurs were experiencing. Um, it took a whole lot longer before we finally started understanding what these are, what these auras are. So um, we use this terminology, cortical spreading depression, and it comes from initially EEGs, electroencephalograms, which look at brainwave activity, showed that there were there was a depression in the brain activity during a migraine aura. And then we got further data with fMRIs, functional MRIs, which when a person is experiencing an aura and goes into the, the machine, 
into the fMRI machine, they see the, these waves uh, of, of discharge that basically activate and depress, activate and depress, and start from the back of the brain and move forward. And it's almost like a seizure spreading to the, through the brain, but that is what causes these zigzag lines mm-hmm. and, and bright uh, lights that we call scintillating scotomas. Um, and so that is part of a classic migraine. So most migraineurs actually don't get auras. Mm-hmm. Um, about 75% of migraineurs don't get auras, but the 25% that do, we call them classic migraines. Okay. And everybody else is common migraines. How interesting, you know, and sometimes even like a glare off a bumper will like trigger it. Sure. And I'll be like, oh God, here it comes. And if I don't take like an 800 ibuprofen, like immediately, sure. I it, it just hurts. Sure. Um, and usually I can catch it, but it's, um, it's interesting that the aura is always a part of it. I know exactly when it's going to happen now. And that's, that's a good thing because uh, for people who get auras, they can <clears throat> medicate right at the time of the aura and actually prevent it from getting into that inflammatory phase where then it becomes much, much harder to treat. Yeah. So you can knock it out, nip it in the bud. Yeah. And, yeah. I just don't get, I mean, I know a lot of people are like, I have a migraine, I have to go sit in a really dark room sure. uh, or I take um, ibuprofen with a Coca-Cola. You know, everybody has, has their, their ways of dealing with it. Sure. What is, what is some treatment, you sure. know, once it's diagnosed, I guess. Sure. Sure. Um, and, and do you mind if I cover, you had asked about yeah. the hormones as well. Oh yes, yes, yes. yes. Let's did, go back to that. I did, I did want to sort of say something about that real quick. So, <clears throat> uh, we talked earlier about how genetics loads the gun, but some, you know, th- there's triggers that actually activate migraines for women. Hormones tend to be a big one. And the two main triggers are a drop in estrogen and progesterone that can happen, for example, right before the menstrual bleed. And mid-cycle, there's a surge in the luteinizing hormone that causes ovulation. Those are two points where a lot of women get migraines. But I think you alluded to this earlier, birth control pills, um, which can mess with the, the whole cascade, can also trigger, trigger migraines in some people. The second um, trigger, which is common to men and women, is stress. Mm -hmm. So when the stress levels are high, that'll trigger a migraine. And the third one is sleep deprivation. So those are the one, two, and three. For men, mainly stress and sleep deprivation. For women, you can add the hormones. In addition to that, there's a myriad of other triggers out there from foods that are rich in tyramines, nitrates, nitrites. So chocolate, aged cheese, red wine, artificial sweeteners, monosodium glutamate, uh, barbecued foods. Mm -hmm. So lots of good stuff in there. But, you know, if it's something that triggers your migraines, you, you know, may need to uh, switch. So, for example, my wife, um, monosodium glutamate is one of her triggers. So she knows that if she eats at P.F. Chang where they don't use Mm. monosodium glutamate, she can eat Chinese food without getting a migraine. You know, so that's uh, those are some. So how is how, you know, the diagnosis, you know, you know, I have a. I have a headache. Mm-hmm. How do I get to see you? You know, how did, how, what's the pro- process to seeing someone with your expertise? Sure. So I, I think most people, when they get migraines, they, um, self-medicate, you know, they take Excedrin or other over-the-counter anti-inflammatories. If that works and the migraines are few and far between, they're happy with that and, you know, figure out other ways to, to cope. The next step is seeing your primary care doctor. Um, and so primary care doctors are obviously, um, can make a, make a diagnosis and institute the appropriate treatments. Um, and, and I can, I can go into the details of that as well. Um, it's when the primary care doctors also feel that, listen, I've tried my best and I haven't been able to get this under control. Let me send you to a headache specialist. Mm -hmm. That's when they'll usually come to a neurologist and within neurology, there is a subspecialty of, um, headache board certification. Uh, like I mentioned, my subspecialty within neurology is brain injury, which, which covers a lot of headaches as mm-hmm. well. Uh, but there's a, the, there's an actual specialty of, of, uh, headache, uh, as well. Wow. I can so. only imagine. So, uh, with diagnosis, I know with, with mine, I went through an MRI and, and, and all of that. Is, is it, is it that extreme? Is it, is an MRI extreme in that case? Um, so it's, it's not. So again, usually MRIs, Regular uh, structural MRIs don't show migraines. In some people with with chronic migraines, you might see little white dots in the brain. We call it, some people call them migraine spots. Um, but generally, MRIs won't show up. I, MRIs won't show the migraine. Maybe it was a CAT scan I got then. 
Sure. And, <laughs> but, 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 but the cats, I'm like, hmm. yeah, but the CAT scans and MRIs are done when people have high, uh, migraines just to make sure we're not missing a tumor okay. or an abscess or some other structural abnormality. The good thing is in 98% of headache patients, the brain imaging comes back normal, and that's a good thing. Right. Because the 2% where it doesn't come back normal, that's not a good good place to mm-hmm. be. Yeah, I can imagine. So, all right. So, we're going to take a quick break again. But when we come back, we're going to continue the conversation uh, about National Migraine and Headache Awareness Month with Dr. Saeed Asad from Universal Neurological. Why can't I say that? See, that's a brain thing right there, right? Universal Neurological Care in Jackson. So stick around. Medicare Connect Radio, sponsored by Millennium Physician Group, will be right back. Welcome to Medicare Connect Radio, sponsored by Millennium Physician Group. I'm Michelle McCormick. Every week, we're talking about the healthcare issues that are important to you, especially if you're 65 or older, maybe approaching 65, or perhaps you're taking care of someone in their golden years. We're inviting providers and experts to share insights into helping you take control of your healthcare decisions. Well, maybe you have a headache every day when you wake up. Maybe it's tension, stress, illness, allergies. That's a big one in the springtime here in Florida. But maybe it's a migraine. June is National Migraine and Headache Awareness month and we're talking with Dr. Saeed Asad, a neurologist from Universal Neurological Care in Jacksonville. And we have uh, talked a lot about um, diagnosing a migraine, um, a little bit of treatment, um, how how we can detect it perhaps, or if it's genetic. What, um, what happens when the over-the-counter medicines, doctor, just just aren't cutting it anymore. Sure, and and over the counter medications do have the da- downside that if you overdo it, it can cause headaches to start rebounding. So an example of that would be, let's say someone starts out with two or three migraines uh, a month. We call that episodic migraines, and um, they start taking a combination medication like Excedrin, which has Tylenol, aspirin, and caffeine in it. Well, it suppresses the headache, but the headache may rebound back in four hours or six hours. They keep suppressing it. It keeps rebounding back. And you can chop these episodic migraines up and end up with a never-ending cycle of Mm. rebound headaches. And so now you've gone from three migraines a month to, like, never-ending migraines. You just keep suppressing them with, with medicine. So medication overuse headache is a problem that sometimes people do to themselves with some of these over-the-counter medicines. Or um, if their physician... Um, doesn't recognize that they're going into that, um, you know, so there are ways to prevent that. Um, from a treatment perspective, when I'm, when I'm talking to my patients about migraine management, the first thing, even before I start talking about medication, I tell them, listen, I can't change your genes at this point. Okay. Maybe in the future we'll be able to change people's (laughs) genetic predisposition predilections and predispositions. But for right now, um, we have some lifestyle things that are helpful. So seven and a half, eight hours of good quality restorative sleep is very, very helpful. So hard. I know in this, in so this hard. day and age, oh, it's very difficult. I wish. But yeah. it's, it's something that we should make a priority. I always tell people it's not a coincidence that we are supposed to spend a third of our life sleeping. Um, if our brain is a computer, that's the most important reboot mechanism for our brain. And we want to reboot it every night so it keeps working well. Um, so very important in the headache context right. as well. Second, regular cardiovascular exercise is good for everything. It's good for headaches too. Stress reduction techniques, which again, exercise is a stress reduction technique, but yoga, tai chi, breathing exercises, mm-hmm. meditation, meditation, mindfulness, yeah. whatever works for you, whatever helps you de-stress, take vacations. You know, all of those things are good. Could be more stressful at times. <laughs> that is true. That is true. <laughs> take the kids to Disney, not a vacation. <laughs> <laughs> Just another location. Yeah. <laughs> and then identifying and avoiding triggers. So, you know, if you live in Northeast Florida and the weather front comes in and gives you a migraine, you, you know, that it's the weather, right? Or if someone has hormonal migraines, that's physiology. You may not be able to change that. But if it's a food trigger and you can switch out the food that's triggering your migraine, then, you know, that may be, that may be a way to do it. Once they've done all the lifestyle things, and they should do that concurrently with, with medical management, there's two major categories treatment-wise. There's preventatives, also known as prophylactic medications, and abortives, which are basically rescue medications. Preventatives are either supplements, medications, injectables, or procedures that decrease migraine frequency and intensity. Um, And then abortives or rescue medications are supposed to knock out the migraine when they occur. And the knockout should be decisive. The migraine should not rebound back if if you can help it. Um, 
So as far as preventatives are concerned, uh, there's supplements like magnesium, riboflavin, which is vitamin B2, uh, feverfew, butterbur, uh, CoQ10. These are these all have mm-hmm. evidence for benefit. Good thing about supplements, few to no side effects. Bad thing about supplements, not super potent, but a good place to start. Mm-hmm. I mean, what's the harm, right? Right. And nowadays, they actually have combination pills where they put all the vitamins in one one pill, mm-hmm. so you don't feel like you're taking a bunch of things. Right. And you can. And you get, still have to take two of those usually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you can just get it over the counter, you know, okay. or Amazon or something. Uh, so that's that's one place to start. Uh, traditionally, Topamax, um, nortriptyline, uh, propanolol. So these are. Some of these are blood pressure medicines. Some of these are, uh, believe it or not, antidepressants. Some of these are anti-seizure medications mm-hmm. that were repurposed for decreasing migraine frequency. And they actually worked, but all of them had a bunch of side effects. So that, that was the limiting thing. Um, about three or four, actually, yeah, 2018, so four years ago, uh, we had a new brand of medications come out. These are monthly injectables that decrease migraine frequency. And it was a brand new concept. So we had known for a couple of decades that these calcitonin gene-related peptides are part of that inflammatory cascade that causes the pain in migraines. And they were a target of interest. But finally, we got medications that um, affect those peptides and, and prevent the inflammation that causes migraines. Now, the initial ones were... Injections and, and the injections contained antibodies or immunoglobulins, and they would go and attach to either the receptor or the peptide itself and decrease the inflammation. They would hang out in the brain for about a month or so, and people noticed that they had decreased migraine frequency, hmm. very well tolerated, other than some injection site reaction and a few other mild symptoms. Uh, so that was the big breakthrough then. And then um, the other breakthrough, and this came about around 2010 was Botox, botulinum toxin. Right. That's yeah. right. I remember that. Yeah. I had someone telling me that today, as a matter of fact, she's like, oh, I got to go get my Botox for my migraines. And I was like, well, I want Botox. <laughs> <laughs> so, so interestingly, interestingly, Botox or botulinum toxin is the most toxic thing known to man that comes from a biological source. And uh, some smart researchers realized that it's a neuromuscular toxin. And when used... Um, judiciously and appropriately, it can actually help a lot of things. But migraines wasn't something anybody had envisioned would potentially benefit from Botox. It was, you know, it was these people who were getting treatment for wrinkles who basically went to their plastic surgeon or Mm -hmm. dermatologist and said, hey, the wrinkles were gone, but so were my migraines. Ding, 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 ding. Yeah. So that, you know, resulted in phase one, two, three, four trials. (laughs) And so 2010 is when we finally got our approval for chronic migraines. Chronic migraines, you, you have to have 15 or more migraine days uh, per month mm. for most insurances to authorize that. Uh, and they usually require that you've tried some of the more you know generic type treatments first, uh, but it works really great for a lot of people. Yeah, that's interesting. I know we talked a little bit about, in, um, in a couple segments ago, about uh, the estrogen and, and we kind of touched back on the hormonal stuff too, but what about as the women in moving into menopause, Sure, you know, and it, seeing an decrease in the estrogen again, sure. um, and maybe they're on HRT, I don't know, but experiencing those ex- same type of migraine, maybe that they experienced as a teenager sure. in their 20s. Sure. And you're right. So again, some of it is thought to be the hormonal fluctuations that happen at, at, at that time around menopause. Um, and some of it is, you know, uh, are they having hot flashes? Is that preventing them from sleeping at night? Mm-hmm. Is that potentially a secondary trigger? You know, so, uh, but, but absolutely we do, we do notice that there's a, a spike for, for a lot of women, particularly the ones that have hormonal migraines. The good news is if that's the only type of migraine they have, once the menopause process is complete, the migraines just might go away and might not be a major issue. Yeah, that's good. We also uh, were briefly talking about the intense migraines that people get and have to go into a very dark room. Um, you know, how, how do you assure a patient that, that they're okay? You yeah. know, that this is, I don't know, I don't want to say this is okay, but this is normal. You know, how do you, how do you treat that patient? So I'm actually pretty aggressive with migraines. Like I want, I want a hundred percent success. And so I try my best to completely knock out the migraine as quickly and efficiently as I can when I have a patient. And and we have the means to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I give the patients an example where I'm like, if you think of the migraine as a beast, okay, 
we could injure the beast or we could kill the beast. I want to just completely get rid of it. And I tell them, you know, my goal is never polypharmacy. I never want to give them a bunch of medications. But at the same time, if the migraine was bad enough and they went to the emergency room, they would get a migraine cocktail where mm -hmm. they would get Tordol and Reglan and Benadryl and, you know, uh, maybe intravenous magnesium. And why does the ER physician give them so many drugs at the same time? Because the ER physician knows that they can hit every single receptor that's involved and completely shut it down. Mm. Well, we don't have to do the same thing at home, but in order to even keep you out of the emergency room, you know, because I would really like my Ooh. ER colleagues to focus on uh, yeah. strokes and heart attacks yes. and, you know, keep, keep migraine patients comfortable where they don't have to go to the ER. So I, I start with, um, you know, so the traditional medications other than anti-inflammatories are your triptans and ergots. So sumatriptan, rizotriptan, those kinds of medications, they work on the serotonin pathways. And that's basically, that prevents the release of the inflammatory and the vasoactive peptides like CGRP. That works, but you have to take it early in the serotonin phase of the migraine. If you miss the serotonin phase of the migraine, the cat's out of the bag. Now you're in the inflammatory phase, and that's where anti-inflammatories mm. might work. Um, what I try to do is, if the patient doesn't have contraindication, so triptans and ergots can squeeze blood vessels. So again, for most people with you know, clean pipes, it's not a problem. But if someone has risk factors for strokes or heart attacks, uh, I don't want my medicine to give them a stroke or heart attack. Right. Um, if the triptans work, awesome. If they don't work, I might combine them with an anti-inflammatory. Um, now we have a newer class of medicine called G-pants that basically target the CGRP pathways as well, just like the monthly injectables, uh, except these are to knock out the migraine. So Nurtec, Ubrel-V, you know, these are some newer medications. Um, and so I might combine a triptan and, and um, a G-pant to get, get that effect. So mm -hmm. Uh, again, the goal is, and I'm always asking my patients, okay, did that help? Yeah, doc, it helped 30% or it helped 50%. Well, I want 100%. 100 yeah. So what can I combine right. to, you know? And then to your question of what do, how do I reassure the patient that this is not an aneurysm? Part of it is, you know, a lot of people who suffer from migraines have been having it their whole lives. Mm -hmm. So when they see these episodic events that are the classic, starts with the aura, maybe headache on one side of their head, throbbing, nausea, vomiting, or light sound sensitivity, no other deficits or red flags, you know, then chances are that's what it is. So we just want to work hard at making sure we knock it out. Yeah. I, um, I have a, a doth piercing. Mm -hmm. So it apparently, uh, you know, I correct me if I'm wrong, that it was like an acupuncture point sure. on your ear it is, yeah. trigger that helps with, with the migraines. Sure. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I had the piercing done. It's super subtle. Um, and I, I can say that every, I was having my, my ocular migraines sure. or my auras every other month. Sure. It was depending on my cycle, sure. absolutely dependent on my cycle. And every other month my cycle was, was made me really mad and angry. And I was a nasty person to be around. Mm -hmm. Now moving to perimenopause and with the doth piercing, I can say I've had a, a migraine with an aura maybe once or twice a year now. Oh, that's awesome. So I think it worked yeah. for me. No, that's great. And, you know, you know, in acupuncture, it's interesting. Prior to the 1970s, um, they used to think acupuncture was all distraction therapy or placebo effect. When President Nixon went to China and witnessed people having surgery under acupuncture anesthesia huh. and brought that back and then people started getting more interested and people started. And, and you know, it's interesting. Allopathic medicine has its own explanation for why acupuncture works versus traditional Chinese medicine has the, you know, the concept of the meridians and the flow of energy and chi and all of that. Irrespective of which theory you subscribe to, the benefits are greater than uh, placebo effect and, and uh, distraction therapy. It's not 100%. It's not magic. It's another medical modality. And it stood the test of time. I mean, it's, it's been around for 3,000 years. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. And, hmm. and by the way, I do, I actually got, certified in acupuncture and I do offer acupuncture as a treatment. It's not something we advertise very much, but I have some patients, actually some migraine patients who've been getting acupuncture long-term and uh, they, it's, really help them decrease their reliance on medications. That's interesting. All right. Well, we're, when we come back, we're going to have our final segment with Dr. Saeed Assad, a neurologist and founder of Universal Neurological Care, his practice here in Jacksonville, Florida. We're going to wrap it up with some takeaways and some contact information as well. So stick around. Medicare Connect Radio, sponsored by Millennium Physician Group, will be right back. 
Welcome to Medicare Connect Radio, sponsored by Millennium Physician Group. I'm Michelle McCormick. Every week, we're talking about the healthcare issues that are important to you, especially if you're over 65, maybe approaching 65, and you're making healthcare decisions for a loved one in their golden years. We're inviting providers and experts to share insights to help you take control of your healthcare decisions. Well, June is National Migraine and Headache Awareness Month. And in this episode, we've been talking about what is a headache, what is a migraine, uh, treatments, diagnosis, and, and everything with Dr. Saeed Assad, a neurologist in Jacksonville. His practice is universal neurology. Neuro- Why can't I say that word, doctor? Um, <laughs> Is it something to do with the pain in my brain all the time? Um, And we have really hit on some amazing conversation about migraines and about headaches. And, and, you know, what are some things that the listeners can take away with them today? So I think, um, you know, we talked about lifestyle. Uh, I am huge on lifestyle. I'm huge on sleep. Um, I actually am going to mention a book. It's called Why We Sleep by this gentleman, Matthew Walker. He's a PhD. He's a sleep researcher. Okay, I'm going to get out Amazon. Okay, Why I, We Sleep. Why We Sleep. Uh, oh my gosh. I mean, it really, it's a very well-written book and it really explains why sleep is so important and why we should really make that a top priority for all of us, not just from the headache perspective, but from, you know, the perspective of preventing dementia and, you know, longevity and all kinds of things. Um, so lifestyle, sleep, those kinds of things. I think the second takeaway, uh, I would mention is don't live with the pain. You don't have to in this day and age. Uh, we have a lot of really good modalities. You know, you mentioned acupuncture, you know, if you're, there's a lot of people nowadays, I I notice in uh, millennials and younger where they're just very skeptical of medications. And, and I respect that. I'm very conservative myself. Mm -hmm. I'm absolutely not anti-medication. I'm a physician. I prescribe medicines all day and I think medicines can be used judiciously, but I also believe that sometimes they can be overused and can cause harm. And so, um, so you do want to be judicious with medication use, but let's say that you're someone who doesn't want to take medications. There are a ton of non-pharmacological treatments, you know, like you mentioned the, uh, the acupuncture treatment that you had. Um, so that's, that's, uh, another important thing, but seek, seek the help, you know, talk to your primary care physician and if they need, uh, further, um, co-management with, with a headache specialist, absolutely seek out a neurologist or, or a headache expert. Um, I think those would probably be the two big takeaways that yeah. I would uh, mention for today. Those are very big ones. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think another thing we touched on earlier in the show, doctor was, um, if the pain isn't like a normal headache pain that you have. It's not the normal, and I say normal in you know quotations. It's yes. like because nothing normal about it. But w- the extreme pain, the numbness. Correct. Excellent. Thank you for bringing that up. Yes, that is a very very important point. Is let's say you are someone who has migraines, but you have this headache that's different from your migraines that has um, different features, of vis- visual features, weakness, numbness. You know cognitive issues, fevers, chills. Um, yes, please, please, uh, get help right away. And that's not even something you want to wait on. You want to go to the emergency room and make sure you're, you don't have an aneurysm that's rupturing or something horrible like that. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So Dr. Saeed Assad, how do we get in touch with you if we need to, uh, ask more questions or seek you out for treatment? Um, sure. Yeah. So you can visit our website at uh, www.universalneurocare.com. Um, and um, uh, certainly if, if, you know, if someone needs to see me as a patient, uh, they can they can actually reach the practice through the website as well. And um, yeah, we'll be happy to to uh, work with them. And- yeah. And you do so much more. Are you, you brain uh, uh, TBI? Um, you do um, this really cool electrode thing that. Oh, yeah. The transmagnetic stimulus. Simulator. Yeah, um, that's a whole nother show we could do, doctor. <laughs> yeah. That's fascinating. But yeah. Um, but yeah, you can reach their office also at 904-404-7044 and universalneurocare.com. So Dr. Saeed Assad, thank you for uh, being our guest today and talking about a very important topic, National Migraine and Headache Awareness Month. Thank you so much for inviting me. 
Well, the conversation will continue next time on Medicare Connect Radio. We also know you have questions, perhaps about Medicare enrollment, and we have answers. You can learn all the basics, discover some plan options, and compare coverage by going to yourmedicareconnect.com or always go to millenniumphysician.com to find a primary care office near you. In good health, I'm Michelle McCormick. Have a great day.